And that is, that is the command of our Almighty God. Make atonement for your lives. Burn incense or you will be cut off. Be counted and pay a census tax or you will have a plague come upon you. I will be in the midst of my people whom I delivered from Egypt and they will be, uh, they will be living in my presence. So therefore, make atonement for your lives. There comes a time in each of our lives where we will be faced with something that is going to be fight or flight. The fright part of that is not really up to you. You will be frightened. But in that fright, do you fight or do you flee? We can, we are tendency to run from threats. Something is so serious, we want to run from it. But how can you run from God? He sees all, he knows all. You go to the ends of the earth, he is there. You go to the pit of Sheol, he's there. Where can I go to hide? Instead, we are a per when God says, I have delivered you from Egypt, and now I am come to live with my people in your midst, my terrifying holy presence. I want to stand here with the Lord, yet we must make atonement for our lives. How? How do we make atonement for our lives where a holy God is with us and not crushing us? He's for us and not against us. And before we go, immediately go into like Christian cliches, oh, to make ourselves feel better, let's go to the reality of this, the weightiness of this, that God is a terrifying presence. And he is a judge according to his holy standards, the perfect law of God. So let's think upon these things as we approach this text. And before we study it, let us pray to the Father for help. Heavenly Father, once again, we come to that hour, that special time set apart from the week that we hear your word preached. And we need your Holy Spirit to help us give understanding to your wisdom that it would be wisely applied to our lives. Lord, may we see the great weightiness of our holy God. And Lord, may we rejoice in the good news of Jesus Christ. So Heavenly Father, we ask for your help. Renew our minds, stir our hearts for a high affection for Christ, and be glorified at this hour. We thank you, Lord, and we ask for your mercies in Jesus' name. Amen. The, the priestly duties cover the priest's senses. There are many bright colors for the eyes and the fabric surrounding the tabernacle. There's the precious stones on the breastplate. Things to touch in the fabrics, the fine linen and the tent and the priestly rose. Imagine going through the tent and lifting these things. You touch, you see. There are things to taste in the bread and the good wine and the meat of the offerings. The bells ringing in the, on the high priest's robes. This fills the senses of our, their ears to hear. But now we, now we turn to smell. Yahweh commands a small altar made simply for burning incense. The priests will smell sweet and spicy incense burning from the altar of incense before the Lord. And it's between the table for the bread of the presence and the golden lampstand, which is in front of the Ark of the Covenant, where God says, I, that is there where I meet with you, God with his people. And between the tabernacle and the altar it was a basin which we could skip over really quickly but it's a basin for the priesthood to wash their hands and their feet before entering the presence of the lord so again the priests are ritually cleansed before they can even continue these other rituals as well there's a lot going on and being that this altar is directly before the face of our god he makes it clear to moses what not to do with this altar Look at me in verses 7 through 9. Aaron shall burn fragrant incense on it. Every morning when he dresses the lamps, he shall burn it. And when Aaron sets up the lamps at twilight, he shall burn it. A regular incense offering uh, before the Lord throughout your generations. You shall not offer unauthorized incense on it or a burnt offering or a grain offering. 
and you shall not pour a drink offering on it. It's only for incense. So don't do these things. This altar was not available to the priest to use it in any way they felt like it. This is not up for debate. This is not, oh, I want you to make an altar of incense, and then, you know, if you want to add some things to it, that's perfectly fine. God says, do this and nothing else. Now, we place, we, we see uh, Yahweh commands an altar for one purpose. That's burning incense. And this speaks to how we use the worship of God even today. We place value of our worship on our own experiences of it. Oh, this worship is great because I experienced it as great. How, how did it make me feel? Did it, did we sing the music genre that I like? Or did somebody sing a music genre I didn't like? Did the prayers that were offered have a deep enough words? Or did they go too long? Or were they too short? Did the sermon make me feel better? So it's always based on my experience of the worship of God. But really, our worship should be, it, it should, does this please my God? Is this something that God said, do this and none of these other things? When we entered in the presence of God to sing his praises, does this please my God? Yet, we can go in many directions with this criticism. Some argue there should be no ritual to worship. Well, it's not here in this text, now is it? Absolutely no ritual, just do whatever you want, whatever feels your fancy. There should be complete disorder and chaos. God doesn't seem to be disordered. Is, Yahweh is saying yes to ritual, but only the ritual in his word, not to add things to it or take things away. Yes to orderly prayers, hymns, psalms, spiritual songs, to the faithful preaching of his word, the public scripture reading. Oh, and with a joyful and thankful heart. So we can miss that, which is completely rationalists. Just say, well, if the Bible says to do this, 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 and these orders, we'll make it orderly. And as lifeless as possible. And that is not where he says it. Enter in with thanksgiving. Where, from where? Heart. To God. With joy. A rejoicing. This is something that you won't find in the world. They have joy, but it's temporary. It's here, there. It's based on their comforts and how they feel about stuff. Our joy is, in the, is a joy that can endure suffering. You see, in Christ, God has drawn nearer than the ark and the priests at the altar of incense. May our worship be a pleasing aroma to our God. And as he is pleased, he is pleased by faith. Faith alone, in Christ alone, to God's glory. So, so well, does this please God? Is it done in faith? Faith in what? Faith in faith? No. Faith in Christ, according to his scripture. So this incense burning was a daily routine of the priests, as we can read. When sacrificial atonement was made for Israel by the high priest carrying the stones of the twelve tribes near his heart, daily the priest would burn this incense mixture before God, who, who resides above the mercy seat, and, he, and they watch the smoke rise. Right? In the last third of this chapter, we find that this mixture is made up of very uncommon sometimes exotic spices, and they're mixed together uh, for, object, for objects to be made for the holy service of the Lord by the priesthood. So we, Yahweh makes it very clear in this. This incense mixture is special to him. It is holy to him in his priestly duty. Nobody's to make one like it or wear it. And the threat is, if they do so, they will be cut off from the community of God. And if you're cut off from the community of God, you're cut off from God's presence with man. Away from his mercy. This speaks to us. Because we, I know we talk a bit about church discipline. And it's still in the same light. When you send someone off to Satan so they would learn not to blaspheme. Or you're treating them, an unrepentant sinner... As a tax collector and a Gentile, as Matthew 18 tells us, to, that they would learn to repent. The cutting off from God's assembly of the church in worship is recognizing false worship in the hearts and lives of those not lovingly, humbly united in Christ's church. And the incense is a symbol of the heavenly court of Yahweh. 
It, it, it represents two things that I see. It's proclamation and prayer. Sometimes you'll go to the studies and it's just prayer. It's proclamation and prayer. Let me make this argument. If you have your copy of God's word, come to Isaiah 6. You might be familiar with this. Isaiah, ha, the prophet, has a vision where he is taken to this heavenly throne room, which is what the ark and all, the tabernacle and eventually the temple represent on earth. But we see this in Isaiah 6, verses 6 through 7. He says, Then one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a burning coal that he had taken with tongs from the altar. And he touched my mouth and said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away, and your sin atoned for. Wow, that's... You've made atonement for your life. Seraphim picked up one of the burning coals from the heavenly incense altar and pressed it upon Isaiah's lips. And for what purpose? It's a prophetic mission. Who will go for God and speak his word? Isaiah volunteers, but he, like us, have unclean lips and we come from a people of unclean lips. What he is saying is, I speak the very language of sin, which God has now called me to go preach against. In Luke 1, we read that an angel of the Lord appeared to Zechariah, who was burning incense at the altar, this very altar we're studying this morning, just to announce that John the Baptist is coming. It's a proclamation mission coming. The voice crying in the wilderness, preparing the way before the Messiah King will be your son, Zechariah. And the angel Gabriel made this announcement. He stands always before the presence of God. That's how he describes himself. The very God he was burning incense to as folks were gathered to pray outside. Yet Zechariah's doubting made him mute, unable to speak of this announcement unable to fulfill this proclamation. Again, the altar of incense is connected to proclamation. Gabriel's proclamation, John's coming to be a prophet of preparation for the Messiah as a preacher, and Zechariah's announcement to other people of John's coming birth. Again, the altar of incense is connected to proclamation. But I want to make it clear just from the uh, book of Exodus. If you go back to Exodus 4, look with me here in verses 10 through 12. Moses said to Yahweh, Oh, my Lord, I am not eloquent, either in the past or since you have spoken to your servant, but I am slow of speech and of tongue. Then Yahweh said to him, Who has made man's mouth? Who makes him mute or deaf or seeing or blind? Isn't it not I, Yahweh? Now, therefore, go, and I will be with your mouth and teach you what you shall speak. But he said, oh, my Lord, please send me, send someone else. <laughs> we, we can say that along with Moses, but he's the, he's the one who does the sending. There's this proclamation mission of Yahweh. We shrug off Christ's command to preach the gospel, to make disciples of all people, mainly with the argument, I'm not gifted enough. I don't like talking to people about Christ. I don't like talking to strangers. I'm not good with words. Well, we are in a sense saying, I have unclean lips and I dwell with a people with unclean lips. I speak the sin language of the people you are sending me on, Lord, please send someone else. Yet, do we believe this burning coal of the altar of incense is not enough to cleanse our mouths? to send us on a mission, to speak boldly of Christ? Do we deny God's power but de by denying his command to proclaim, thinking, well, that we should send the ones who know how to speak. We should send the ones who know how to do this better, the ones who are extroverted or somebody that is more eloquent than I am. I'll s just send them with them, but don't send me. Send someone else. Yet, the major focus of this altar uh, of incense is the prayers of the people of God being offered to and heard by God. 
The, the incense burning symbolized the prayers offered to Yahweh. You see this in uh, the 141st Psalm. Psalm 141, the first two verses reads, O Lord, I call upon you, hasten to me. Give ear to my voice when I call to you. Now I hear this. Let my prayer be counted as incense before you and the lifting up of my hands as the evening sacrifice. So David is referring to this altar. The daily ritual before God's face in which incense was burned, David referenced as his voice calling out to God and crying out, Hear my prayer, Lord. We hop ahead to Revelation 5, 8, which says when um, he had taken the scroll, this is the lamb, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb, each holding a harp and golden bowls of full of incense. But then he had, John adds this, which are the prayers of the saints. So the lamb has this golden bowl of this incense brought before him. And John says that is our prayers as saints. That's the how long, O oh Lord, and the why this pain, and Lord, I, comfort me now, and wh why do I have to go through this frustrating circumstance? I don't have the strength, Lord. This life gets tough, and it's tougher when you're striving to live a life of godliness. There's even added pressure with that. Not only tough by affliction, but also because I long to be with my Savior face to face. I long for him to hear my cry for help, to wipe away tears, not with cliches, comforts that this earth, earth can do, but a genuine and final wiping of those tears. Now, I may suffer here, but I, I know this, and I have this confidence. The incense prayers of us, the saints, are gathered before my Savior in the end. I am heard, we are heard, and he, our great high priest, with heart gentle and lowly, cares about you. Yes, anxious, breaking, needing, mending you are heard. You are heard, and he is able and willing to act, and he cares for you. We see this in Revelation 8, a few chapters later. Verses 4 through 5 reads, uh, The smoke of incense with the prayers of the saints rose before God from the hand of the angel. Then the angel took the censer and filled it with fire from that altar and threw it on the earth. And there were peals of thunder, rumblings, flashes of lightning, and an earthquake. He will take our incense prayers that were lifted to him. And Christ will right every wrong. He will wipe every tear. And with justice rolling like a mighty river, he will judge and redeem this earth we are traveling through. And we, the meek, will inherit. God hears the prayers of his people at the altar of incense. He has provided atonement for your sins, for your love. Yet this comes to be counted like a census. And with that count, pay a tax to make atonement for your lives. It's the actual wording. This chapter opens with the altar of the incense is burned before God's face. Then it ends with the spices and incense mixture that are, the priests are to use on a daily basis. And sandwiched between this understanding of the altar of incense is this paragraph about Collecting a census tax. So back in Exodus 30, start in verse 11. The Lord said to Moses, When you take the census of the people of Israel, then each shall give a ransom for his life to the Lord when you number them, that there will be no plague among them when you number them. The census tax meant each Israelite contributed to the maintenance of the tabernacle and the people who served God. The accounting of Israelites was the command of each person to contribute to the worship of God. Stand to be counted as God's people. And as you are counted, pay as your worship offering to God 
making atonement for your lives. The, the very fact that there is a cost for their redemption tells them the very seriousness of the wrath of God. Because this, co this command comes with a threat and a word that would pierce their ears. It's not just bad things are going to happen to you. He uses the word plague. They know what a plague looks like. They bore witness to that. We saw the plagues that he did to the Egyptians. Mean those plagues? Yes, those plagues. Make atonement for your lives, and I will not send a plague on you. And you're to be counted to pay as your worship offering to God. The very, this, this command comes with that threat. Pay your taxes to, or Yahweh will send the plague. And this, make atonement or pay a ransom for your life. You see this in verse 12 and 16. Let's combine that together. It says, When you take the census of the people of Israel, then each shall give a ransom for his life to the Lord when you number them. Now come down to verse 16. He says, You shall take the atonement money from the people of Israel and shall give it for the service of the tent of meeting that it may bring the people of Israel to remembrance before the Lord so as to make atonement for your lives. No plague among the number counted in the census, will come if you pay this. It's in the sense that God is holding back plagues. It's his own wrath. He says, I'm holding back my wrath. Pay. Pay your taxes. Or it's going to come. He will continue holding back the plague so long as the people are faithful to pay this tax. There's a, there is a need to run from God's wrath and be saved, basically. I, I, hear, I hear this cliche, the devil's going to get you. I, no, he's not. <laughs> he, he's been rendered powerless. He's a liar, a tempter, an accuser. He lies, tempts, and accuses for what? God's wrath. And I'm assured that God's wrath is held back, but not, not because of Satan, not because of my faithfulness. I'm not afraid of Satan. I'm afraid of God. And God demands our holiness, our service, and here demands even my money. In Second Chronicles 24, the, when King Joash brought um, the reforms after Israel made Baal places of worship, it was awful. He went to repair the damages uh, and the neglect of the temple. Joash gathered the priests and Levites and asked for the census tax that we are reading now in Exodus 30 so that he can make the needed repairs. But the priests disobeyed. They seemed, to, they seemed to have fallen prey to the Baal worship themselves. So then the king puts an offering box outside the temple gate and the funny thing happened. The people rejoiced. They were so happy to have this invitation to worship God again. The priests meant to faithfully, who are made to faithfully burn only incense on this altar and collect a census tax to the upkeep of the house of God, this house of prayer, were unfaithful. And the joyful, thankful response of worship by the people of God says this. The unfaithfulness of the priests were holding back the right worship of Yahweh by his people. And now we, in New Testament times, we're commanded to each contribute to the worship of God in Christ. How we see fit and according to our own heart. Now physically, this building needs upkeep. Um, boy, do we know it. <laughs> it's large. It has a roof. Um, there's things that need to be done. There are things that need to be purchased. And those dedicated to the service of prayer and word and pastors and their families are to be cared for. Yet it is far more than this. There are those who give with a heart desiring reputation. The reputation of godliness. Like, kind of like the parable of Jesus taught about the Pharisee praying before God's presence. Thankful that he gives more than required. And why does he do so? For the reputation of godliness. There are those who give for power. I give so I can have influence in this place. But God delights not in how much. Or whether or not we have a building. 
We could, all this could be stripped away, and you know what? The worship of God is still commanded. The, a, God requires to give cheerfully a thankful, joyful worship offering. And I'm going to tell you, that requires faith. Because in any other way, we're going to walk away sorrowful because we had great possessions. It sounds like I, 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 I long to go before the face of God and to offer all that he demands in his rightful worship. In giving and giving to God with cheerfulness, with thanksgiving in our hearts towards God, we, we join with these Israelites proving the money we give is not our God. I give because this is not my God. I give because God asks it. And if, he, if my Lord asks for this money, I will give it cheerfully, and I will give it with rejoicing. Now, I want to connect this in our minds to the gospel. This census tax to upkeep the tabernacle and the livelihood of the priests settled when the Hebrews came to the promised land and built the temple. So the tabernacle becomes the temple. This over time became the temple tax, as we learn the time of King Joash. So now we call it a temple tax. How, how did Jesus pay his temple tax? Do you recall? Yeah, I remember someone from the crowd asked Simon Peter if their rabbi Jesus paid the didrachma, the, the two drachma tax. That is... Half shekel, the half shekel temple tax that you're reading of right here for the temple. And Peter, as he does, he just says before knowing, yes, of course he does. But then Peter went to Jesus and with even, without even prompting, Jesus asked, it just, if earthly kings collect taxes from others or their own sons, well, Peter answered, well, you know, when kings demand a tax, he doesn't tax his own children. He taxes others. <laughs> Makes sense. Jesus said, therefore, the sons are exempt. Well, that's, wow, that, that's amazing. Yahweh, king of the temple, does not collect taxes from his own children. Now, get this. Jesus said, let's not offend them, meaning... Those who ask about the temple tax, go ahead, let's go ahead and pay it. Simon, fisher of men, go outside, go fishing. And inside the mouth of that first fish you catch, you will find a whole shekel. Remember, half a shekel is required. Go ahead and pay that whole shekel for me and for you. But Jesus paid both his and Peter's temple tax. Peter didn't go out and earn that. Where'd you get your half shekel to pay the temple tax, Peter? Well, <laughs> um, so Jesus told me to go fishing, and I just, the temple tax came out of a fish's mouth. Um, it was free. It was free because he's a son. Jesus puts, puts feet, to, you know, right there, the, a living parable before Peter. I'll pay your temple tax. I'll pay it along with you. Jesus gave Peter the coin for the offering plate like a parent gives a quarter to a child just to feel like they're included in the worship of God. Well, the offering plate, everybody else is putting it in. Well, I'm going to give it to my little kid that way they can joyfully join in the service. This is like this communal thing. And how nice would it be to pay our earthly king's taxes by just going fishing? Um, but wait, your temple tax to Yahweh is much, much greater. Earthly kings demand earthly materials. Pay this census and make atonement for your life. Pay the ransom, the value of your life. That's God's wording, not mine. How much is your life worth to you? How much do you need to pay an eternal God who has everything that you may buy for yourself eternal life? Answer, you can't afford it. You can't. Now, this is usually where the prosperity gospel preachers go off into some really crazy idea about how much you need to give to this church and into my ministry and line my pockets that you may be blessed. 
God's not withholding blessing from you because I would anything I could command because that's going outside of Scripture. I'm telling you what it's saying in here. You can't afford it. You can't pay atonement for your life. You cannot buy everlasting life. You cannot pay the ransom that is upon your soul. If you want to buy everlasting life, you're going to have to have an everlasting treasure, and you've got nothing of it. But Christ does. Christ pays the atonement money like he paid for Peter's temple tax. To be in God's presence for you. God demands from his law his perfect worship, and in that perfect worship is to pay a high cost that's too high for you and me to pay in a thousand lifetimes of earnings. Christ has the perfect payment. You were bought with a price, beloved. And that price is Christ and Christ alone. God demands joyful worship that we came downcast. In Christ, he gives joy by his free mercy. God demands peace and total trust. And we came in anxious and heavy burdened. In Christ, he gives rest and peace by free mercy. God provides the perfect worship he demands freely in Christ and in Christ alone. Martin Luther once quipped, that it is our responsibility, especially mine as a preacher, to get the gospel to your ears. And God will get it from your ears to your heart. And that is my heart's plea before the Father now. That is my offering of incense. As my prayer for each of you rises like the smoke of this incense, that you would get this. As you walk in your mind through this tabernacle court, picture the sights the priests in holy garments, slaughtering animals before God for your forgiveness, burning incense, collecting money. Hear the sounds of the bells of the high priests representing you before God who, to go in there to offer prayers for you and for your forgiveness. Think of the feeling of the priests touching the linens and the fabrics, the, t- putting their hands on animals, to, that they're about to slaughter, touching the table, touching the altars, but never touching the ark. Think of the taste of the bread of the presence and the, the wine for dr- the drink offering and the cooked meats of sacrifice to God enjoyed by these priests. Now I'll turn your attention to the smells. This potent mixture of sweet spice, it's intense. And they're the incense as your pleas for mercy are taken by the priests and offered to God. Hebrews 9 refers to this very tabernacle tent, the priest's duties of sacrifice, and also this gold incense. In Hebrews 9, verses 11 through 12, it reads this, they, um, when Christ appeared as a high priest of the good things that have come, Then through the greater and more perfect tent that is not made with hands, that is not of this creation, he entered once for all into the holy places, not by means of the blood of goats and calves, but by means of his own blood, thus securing an eternal redemption. He secured your eternal redemption. You know, who pays this this price? How can I pay this for my life. In Christ, our pleas for mercy always burns in the perfect once for all high priestly incense. He intercedes where our prayers muffle into groanings like the groanings of this creation. We are heard, though, and we are loved by the Father. We should not read Exodus 30 with this hopeless weight upon us. God commands us to make atonements for our lives, and he commands that we would do so perfectly. Or else, a plague will come upon us. Or else, we will be cut off from his presence. Or else, we will surely die. So we must make payment. So I say, look. Look upon what Christ has done and who he is. He has paid our tax. And in his Lamb's book of life, we are counted in the census of God's people. Look at Christ's continued faithfulness for you even now. Faith, beloved, 
faith in Christ's payment to make atonement for you. This pleases the Father perfectly. Want to be a pleasing sacrifice to God? Then trust in Christ. Now look at your own works. Now look at it while this is what I offer. If we offer to God Christ, look to Him, look to His works, be saved from the coming plague, be saved from ever being cut off from His presence, be saved to enjoy His presence now and forever. I ask the band as the return up here and becoming a singing church once again. And as we prepare to sing praises to our gracious God, let us pray to the Father together. Heavenly Father, this the price for our souls to enter into your eternal glory, into your presence forever, to enjoy you forever, is a, high, a price too high for us to pay. The very fact that there is a cost to pay challenges our minds. We think that we have rights and we have none. Yet, Lord, you have provided Christ the perfect sacrifice who has paid once for all, that we may enter in to enjoy your presence, never to be cut off. Oh, Lord, that you would be motivated to do this by your steadfast love. Lord, we rejoice that you care. We rejoice that our prayers are heard. And now, oh Lord, we ask that you, our God of comfort, would bless us for your glory's sake. In Christ we pray. Amen.